Welcome to Black Discoveries, where we delve into the captivating narratives of extraordinary individuals who've shaped history through their resilience and determination. In today's episode, we unravel the inspiring journey of Biddy Mason, a remarkable woman who transcended the horrors of slavery to become California's wealthiest black woman. Join us as we explore her story of triumph, resilience, and unwavering spirit in the face of adversity. In the early 19th century, a woman named Biddy Mason embarked on a remarkable journey that would take her from slavery to becoming one of the most influential figures in Los Angeles history. This is the story of Biddy Mason, a woman of strength, resilience, and unwavering determination. In slave roots, Biddy Mason was born into slavery around August 15, 1818, in Hancock County, Georgia. Although we don't know the exact place or date of her birth, as a child, she endured the tough life of a cotton plantation where enslaved people faced incredibly difficult conditions. During her teenage years, she learned skills like cooking and farming. She also learned about herbal medicine and delivering babies from other enslaved women. This knowledge was useful for both enslaved people and their owners. We don't have records of Biddy being sold, but at some point, she was sold to Robert May Smith and Rebecca Dorn Smith in Mississippi. The Smiths valued Biddy because she knew a lot about medicine, taking care of children, and looking after livestock. Biddy had three children, Ellen, born around 1838, Anne, born around 1844, and Harriet, born around 1847. We don't know who the fathers of her children were, but some think Robert M. Smith might have been the father of at least one of them. Another enslaved woman named Hannah Smiley, later called Embers, also worked with Biddy on the Smith farm. The Smiths had bought her from Rebecca's father's estate. Hannah had three children when the family moved out west. Missionaries from the Mormon church came to Mississippi and taught Robert Smith, his wife, and their six children about their faith. They all converted to Mormonism in 1847. In those times, enslaved people could only learn about the religion and get baptized if their owner allowed it. We don't know if Biddy was baptized. The Smith family joined a group of other church members from Mississippi to travel with the Mormons who were leaving Nauvoo, Illinois, in 1847. They journeyed to Pueblo, Colorado, and met up with a group of sick people from the Mormon Battalion. During the trip out west, Biddy took care of animals, cooked meals, and helped with childbirth while also looking after her own kids. Later, they joined the rest of the Mormons traveling to Utah, and arrived in the Salt Lake Valley in 1848. In all, 34 enslaved people went with their owners to the Utah Territory. They worked hard building cabins, clearing fields, and planting crops in the town of Cottonwood in the Salt Lake Valley. In 1851, a leader of the Mormon church named Brian Young sent some Mormons to Southern California. He told them that California was a place where slavery was not allowed, and if they brought enslaved people there, those people would become free. Robert Smith, the man who owned Biddy and her family, went to live in San Bernardino, California. Biddy was one of the enslaved people who lived there too. Even though California became a free state in 1850, some people from the South, like Robert Smith, still brought enslaved people with them. Unfortunately, the courts in California usually supported the slave owners and didn't agree with enslaved African Americans when they said they should be free. Biddy was controlled by Robert Smith and didn't know about the laws or her rights. This was the first step in her incredible journey towards freedom. Freedom in California. In 1856, Robert Smith decided to move to the slave state of Texas and sell his slaves there. He promised his slaves that they would be free in Texas. Biddy was worried about being separated from her children and staying enslaved, so she talked to two free black men, Charles Owens and Manuel Pepper. These men, along with sheriffs and others, gave Smith a court order. A court in Los Angeles looked at the case about her freedom. Smith said that Biddy wanted to go to Texas, but he also paid her lawyer not to come to court. Biddy couldn't speak in court, because the law in California didn't allow black people to testify against white people. When Smith didn't come to court on January 21, 1856, the judge, Benjamin Ignatius Hayes, set Biddy and her family free. In 1860, she got a paper that said she was free. When she was enslaved, Biddy didn't have a last name. After she became free, she started using the last name Mason. Some people think she might have picked that name to honor someone named Amasa Mason Lyman, but it's more likely that Mason was her family name from when she lived in Hancock County, Georgia, a new life. After she became free, Mason and her daughters went to live with Robert Owens. 
He was Charles Owen's father and a well-known businessman in Los Angeles. Ellen, one of Mason's daughters, would later marry Charles Owens. Mason worked in Los Angeles as a nurse and midwife, helping to deliver many babies during her career. She even used her knowledge of herbal remedies to care for people during the smallpox epidemic in Los Angeles. One of the doctors she worked for was John Struther Griffin. She saved her money wisely and became one of the first African-American women to own land in Los Angeles. Her land, right where Spring Street and Broadway are today, became a special place for the black community. It was like a safe and welcoming home for them in a time when they needed it most. As a businesswoman, she became quite wealthy and gave a lot to charities. She also helped feed, shelter, and visit prisoners. She played a big role in starting a traveler's aid center, a school, and a daycare for black children, which was open to any child who needed it. People often called her Auntie Mason or Grandma Mason because of her kind and giving nature. In 1872, Mason, along with her son-in-law Charles Owens and other black residents of Los Angeles, helped start the first African Methodist Episcopal Church of Los Angeles. This was the city's first black church, and they held the organizing meetings in her home. She even gave the land where the church was built. She also helped set up the first elementary school for black children in Los Angeles. Biddy Mason was not just a landowner, she was a leader and a helper for her community. Mason could speak Spanish fluently and was well known in the city. She sometimes had meals at the home of Pio Pico, who was the last governor of Alta California and a rich landowner in Los Angeles. Family, Biddy Mason's daughter, Ellen got married to Charles Owens and they had two sons named Robert Curry Owens, born in 1859, passed away in 1932, and Henry Louis Owens, born in 1861, passed away in 1893. Robert Curry Owens became very well known in Los Angeles and was considered the richest black man in the city for many years. Sadly, Henry L. Owens passed away in 1893. As Robert Curry Owens got older, he got involved in politics and real estate. He even owned a building called the Owens Block, which was a two-story brick building on Broadway. This building became the very first black-owned business building in downtown Los Angeles. Legacy and Recognition Biddy Mason used to say, an open hand gives and receives blessings in abundance, but a closed hand receives nothing good. After Biddy Mason passed away on January 15, 1891, she was laid to rest in Evergreen Cemetery in Boyle Heights. On March 27, 1988, there was a special ceremony attended by the mayor of Los Angeles and members of the church she helped create. They placed a gravestone at her burial site. Biddy Mason is remembered in the California Social Work Hall of Distinction. There's also a special day, Biddy Mason Day, which is celebrated on November 16. During one of these ceremonies at Broadway Spring Center, a memorial was unveiled to honor her achievements. Near where Biddy Mason used to live, there's an 82-foot-long concrete wall dedicated to her memory. This wall has objects embedded in it that tell the story of her life. It's part of Biddy Mason Park, which is a city park in downtown Los Angeles. Additionally, there's an art installation called Biddy Mason's Place, a passage of time designed by artist Sheila Leverett de Breville. It's another 82-foot-long concrete wall with embedded objects that narrate the story of Biddy Mason's life. You can also find a mural of Biddy Mason by artist Bernard Zakheim in UC Hall at the University of California, San Francisco. However, this painting, dating back to the 1930s, is facing demolition as part of a campus upgrade. Biddy Mason's impact lives on through the places and organizations named in her honor. Her influence on Los Angeles and the struggle for civil rights remains profound. In 1988, the house where she once lived was turned into Biddy Mason Park, a place to remember her remarkable life and contributions to the city. This park stands as a tribute to her enduring legacy. Biddy Mason's life journey, from enslavement to liberation, echoes the unwavering spirit of those who battled for their rights. Her tale is a wellspring of inspiration, underscoring the strength found in determination, resilience and the relentless pursuit of justice. Biddy Mason's legacy is a reminder that even in the face of adversity, individuals can bring about profound change and leave an indelible mark on history. Biddy Mason's life serves as a profound reminder that even amidst the darkest of circumstances, the human spirit can radiate brilliantly, illuminating the path towards a brighter tomorrow. Her legacy remains vibrant, a guiding light of hope, 
and an everlasting emblem of the relentless struggle for freedom and equality.